Australia. Resource rich, land of opportunity. One of the wealthiest countries in the world. But we're also one of the most unequal. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. It wasn't so obvious 10 years ago, but now it is becoming very obvious. After 25 years of relentless economic expansion, nearly 3 million live below the poverty line. I got to see a side of poverty that I actually didn't even know existed, you know? They're stuck on the bottom rung. We're sick and tired of not being heard and sick and tired of struggling. There's not enough money being put back into the people. Feeling left behind in the land of the fair go. Even these sewer rats have a place in society and I'm the odd one out. In this series, we hear from those whose lives are a daily struggle. We're not terrorists, we're humans. We're Aussies, you know what I mean? The forgotten battlers trying to make ends meet and hear from those trying to help. Yeah. If we don't give them a bed or a couch, where else do they go? And the families trying to hold things together. And my dream is just to never give up. <laughs> and I'm doing this for my kids, for my family and my wife. But when the system turns against you... We've got no assistance. We've got no help. That man handle me. And the ones that are hurt are the ones you love. Oh, uh, look, I mean, you're scaring my son. This is what it takes to remove me from my house. That's when you could end up on Struggle Street. In Australia, we're constantly told by our government how lucky we are. After all, we dodged the global financial crisis. But across every city and country town, many of us are barely making ends meet. Try living on New Start when you're 57 and you've worked all your life. Try, try living in a tent with no income at all, mm. stealing to eat. Even my mum personally is struggling and she's working our ass off. She's working three different jobs just to support us kids. Even Australia's third largest economy, Queensland, is home to some of the country's most disadvantaged areas. One such area is Inala. Near 20% unemployment blights the postcode area 4077 a melting pot of cultures in the outer southwestern suburbs of Brisbane. 477 is a multicultural area. You know, we've got um, Aboriginals, we've got um, Asians, we've got um, Cook Islanders like myself, we've got Samoans. You know, we all just, we all come together as one. You know, we're all family here. That's why we go by the name 77. Post-war public housing defines the area which is also home to one of the largest Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in the city. Yagara woman Karen Coghill grew up here. Inala is always based as a low socioeconomic area. The powers that be, they need a ghetto in every major city, and Inala's it. We've had just so much breakdown in community. It's like the politicians forget that they are there for the people. Many, like Karen, go back generations in Anala and despite its challenges, are fiercely proud of their home. So if you're told to get out of the home you love, it can be devastating. The warrant to be executed as soon as reasonable, practical, after taking effect. Karen's friend Norma has just received a notice of eviction and their friend Marlene is round to help make sense of the decision. They're using the police raids against me. You've been to court for the raids? Did anything come out of the raids? Was there possessions of drugs or utensils found? 24-year-old daughter Keisha has recently been convicted for possessing a water pipe and smoking marijuana in the house. It means Norma's breached her public housing tenancy. It's a minor offence. It's not as though it's a big... And it was dealt with in the courtroom. And it was for her personal, you know, her own personal use. The single mother of six has an open door policy for local children in need, but it's caused disturbances involving the police. And housing has warned Norma before about antisocial behaviour. Well, I was getting raided, you know, quite a bit in Nala, actually. I could have feed up to 17 to 25 people 
in a week, any one night. But that's something I've always done and I grew up with. Family should always be there and have that open heart. They've taken everything from me. I don't have nothing. That letter means I got no house. My children don't have a home. That means I'm going to be homeless on my land and my country from my ancestors. Just get, what am I to do? What can I do? I don't have any rights in the eyes of Queensland Housing and Anala Housing. They don't even want to listen to me. You know, I was born here. I've lived all my life in Brisbane. Anala is my home. Entry under the warrant shall only be between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And this was sent from the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. I can't get out, we're in the middle of winter. What am I gonna do? How, do you, how can you explain to an eight-year-old child that we've been kicked out because of police and everything else? They've only known one home, they don't know any other home. I, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, it's, oh my God. They want you out. They're gonna come here, all arms, police, everything, to get you out. We're told if we work hard and live within our means, we'll get on. And if times get tough, the system is there to catch us. The fair go is a cornerstone value of what makes us proud to be Australian. But nowadays, it doesn't always apply to everyone. When I arrived in Australia in 1989. We were entitled to Centrelink and um, all the benefits. Um, in 2001, it changed. Anyone that came after that date were no longer entitled to any benefits or Australian government support, except for the family tax. In one legislative stroke, the Howard government's change to the benefits system left more than 140,000 Kiwi residents without a safety net, should times get tough. Based near Anala, the Koha Shed was co-founded by Lily and Mike. Culturally, you know, Kiwis, it's not in our nature, it's not in our culture to turn people away, you know? You, we weren't brought up like that. The charity provides accommodation for those with nowhere to go. But unlike the Australian government, it helps all nationalities, not just Kiwis. This is our first house. It's been open since the 27th of April 2015. That's Phil. Phil is one of our Kiwi boys that stay here and not entitled to any benefits, eh? Isn't that right, Phil? Yeah, yeah no government support. For just under four and a half years ago. What for? But can you try and get into it? And I can only get it for six months. You've got to be in the country for 10 years yeah. and then you only entitled to it for six months. Yeah. And that's just the new start or? New start, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And at the moment you don't have no income support or? No. All I can get is uh, the uh, housecare card. Which entitles you to cheaper Bus medication, transport. Medication and stuff, yeah. yeah. Ironically, Australians living in New Zealand can claim benefits after only two years. Phil, did you want a cuppa? Uh, I was going to tell you get stuck anyway. <laughs> 13 men live in the four bedroom shelter, and the charity is struggling with high running costs. I'm a recovering heroin addict, been clean for three years now. These guys have been very supportive. This is a stepping stone. From here, you move on to try to get your own place or share accommodation with someone else again, you know? And then from there, you try and get your own place eventually. We don't get no funding from the government. How we survive is those that are on Centrelink or working, um, they contribute. They pay a contribution each week. So each person is income assessed. The rest of us are all volunteers. We don't get no wage or anything. Gotta keep you on your toes, Phil. If 
I didn't have that support, I'll be honest, I think I would be using heroin again. I would be. But this time I've chosen a different path. The Koha Shed's philosophy of not turning anyone away means the fledgling charity is selling close to the wind with Queensland housing. We have 13 in house at the moment, and to them we're promoting overcrowding. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when we get those knocking at our doors or the phone calls that, and it's raining, they've got nowhere to go. You know, they just want a hot meal. They want somewhere to be just warm. So, yeah, at the moment, winter is our crazy time. Yeah. There are many different paths to Struggle Street. Two major culprits are mental illness and drugs. More than four million Australians will experience a mental disorder at some time in their life, of which nearly a third will have a drug or alcohol problem. They've either got a mental health issue and mental health people won't help them because they've got a drug issue, and a drug issue people won't help them because they've got a mental health issue. There's a complete backward system. But there's drugs everywhere in Australia, it doesn't matter where you are. But they always like to put the spotlight on on the low income areas, on the struggling areas. Well, it's escapism. You think the world's a better place when you're high. Uh, you don't have to deal with all the shit that's going on in your head. Ice has exploded onto our streets in recent years. But in some areas of Melbourne's inner suburbs, heroin is also king. All right, well, you both come in then. Come on. Because if one doesn't come in, the other won't. Michael lives in the inner west Melbourne suburb of Seddon. The former truck driver has battled addiction and mental health problems his entire adult life and now lives in transitional housing. OK, old fella, let's see you on the couch as usual. And how are your legs today? This is Kaiser. Kaiser's 14. And um, Whittle's one. I've been a bit depressed and um, the house is an absolute pigsty. And, um, and it's just all gone on top of me. And um, I'm a little bit ashamed of, of the state of it. Yeah, I know, I've got to clean the house up. I know, I know, Kaiser, I know, I know, I know, I know. Oh, what a shit fucking life. Oh, fuck's sake. You know, and you've you got to say to yourself, how did it get like this? I mean, yeah, I was on drugs in the 90s, but, gee, I must be the world's biggest arsehole. I've got a lot of acquaintances and a lot of friends, but um, no good friends. I, what, yeah, I, I, not, not counting you. I'm talking about humans, Kaiser. Michael's life went off the rails when he suffered years of bullying at school. No-one knows except God and me, how much I fucking suffered at school at the hands of those bastards. I just wanted to have friends, you know. They, they took me shoplifting and I shoplifted for them. I, I let myself get used completely. By 19, he was hooked on heroin. You start hanging around with those shit bags that shoot up. And before you know it, you're putting your arm out and getting your first hit. And it's a powerful feeling. Everyone I know died during the 90s. Everyone that I started using drugs with. Maybe one or two I see occasionally that are still alive. Um, everyone. Michael's been off the hard stuff for nearly 20 years, but is on prescribed methadone and his mental health remains fragile. But today is not a good day for another reason. Yeah, I'm just feeling sorry for myself because it's a shitty day. I've got to bury mum today and... Um, Mum wasn't a nice mum, but um, but she was my mum, and um, yeah. So so I got a, um, and it's going to be a really humiliating experience. Um, I don't have shoes to wear. I got paid Wednesday, and I paid my rent. I paid the bills I had to pay. I dodged the ones I could dodge, and I got sixty dollars left on Friday. Every week, it's the same struggle with 110 of his $400 benefit going on rent. I'm sick of going hungry, and, and I haven't got the rest of the cans that the dogs need for this week yet. I, I haven't had the energy to go to the shop. I've just been buying them one at a time. So, so I can't afford fucking shoes. My family hate my guts. 
They don't want anything to do with me. I, I could show you some text messages um, over the last few days, just, just threatening messages from different relatives. You know, you junky dog, you this, you that. Uh, no wonder your parents were ashamed of you. <laughs> you junky dog. I mean, imagine being called that a few days after your mum's dead. The 44-year-old may not have decent shoes for the funeral, but he's still determined to show up. I don't really go in the bathroom that often. <laughs> so it's easier for me to just to take this light globe around than to go and spend $3.50. <sighs> what a pain in the ass. <sighs> Shit. I just don't want to massacre myself too much. Because um, this is working all right. Because um, I don't want to be bleeding all over the place at Mum's funeral. My relatives, I'm sure, will be worried about getting AIDS or something off of me because I'm such a bad junkie. Assholes. I had a pretty good life when I was a teenager. My, my, my parents aren't poor. Um, I went to a mentor and grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for three years anyway. Then I went to Monaday boarding school. Anyway, I've got to stop talking and get this done. We were very much loved when we were children, me and my brother. We weren't loved as teenagers and uh, as adults, but we were loved when we were kids. Flex for the camera. Michael was on the streets with Kaiser for two years. So keeping hold of his few belongings was tough. I used to have a really nice um, suit. I had to bury it, and uh, it didn't survive the burial. I, I thought I buried it and wrapped it in plastic pretty good, but I discovered roots grow through even triple bagged plastic, and after months and months, and um, yeah, the the pants didn't survive. But the suit jacket, not too bad. Half of me wants to go in there absolutely smelling, you know, and sitting next to them, you know, and making them suffer my presence, you know. They hate me that much. I've had nothing to do with them for 30 years. I, I'm not an asshole. I'm not. And um, I just have to keep reminding myself that. The old saying, charity begins at home, doesn't ring more true than for the Koha Shed in Brisbane. Ongoing issues with registering the men's shelter and high running costs have resulted in its closure a week ago. Lily and husband Pai have now personally stepped in. We since closed the men's shelter and most of them had sourced out their own alternative accommodation. Um, we had three that weren't able to. We wouldn't let them go to the street. We didn't have the heart to send them to the street. So we've brought them home. The five bedroom house in southwest Brisbane is already packed to the rafters with 15 members of Lillian Pye's family, plus nine shelter residents. Upstairs is where all our family live. Um, we've got our four children and their children and their partners. And then downstairs we have the three homeless and a family. Here's the couches, the tally, three beds. Rex is from the recently closed men's shelter. He shares this room with two other men. Well, um, I come out of um, prison. I was pretty much um, a no-hoper. I didn't have a bail address. Um, Practically the Kaha Shed um, gave me life outside the bars. Rex suffers mental illnesses and then he needs that support care, that 24-7 support care and solid support networks behind him. You know, he's always had us or someone else around. Rex is lucky. He's Australian and so qualifies for transitional housing a short-term place to help get him back on his feet. I get out in two days down to another part of Brisbane. I guess um, it's a new lifestyle. We've got to get off the drugs and as I've been doing and 
create a better life. Nearly half of those who leave prison in Australia are homeless within the first six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kiwis Jared and Sharon aren't even as fortunate as Rex. They arrived in Australia after 2001, which means they're entitled to nothing except $400 a week family tax benefit, paid to support their four kids. This was our daycare Sorry, for our kids. <laughs> it's OK. We had a family that reached out to the Koha Shed that we were becoming homeless and um, we transformed it into their bedroom. <laughs> and their kitchen and their laundry, eh? <laughs> and their playroom. Yeah, they their yeah, their playroom now. Yeah, so this is the yeah, this is our whanau. <laughs> Which is family. <laughs> you're a, you're a diggy. Jared was incarcerated at one of the remand centres here. He reached out to us the weekend that they were facing homelessness and he was scared. He was absolutely scared and broken that him and his children, his four kids, had nowhere to go. Teenagers Trinity and Tian and younger siblings Peyton and Shelby are all crammed into this garage with their parents. Mum and Dad and Peyton, the five-year-old sleep in the queen bed. <laughs> Shelby sleeps there, Tian and Trinity. It's not much, but hey, we make it as the best we can. It's a roof over my kid's head and mine and Jared's. It might not be much, but to me, it's everything at the moment. Both are ice addicts, and Jared's also spent 16 months in jail on remand for serious drug trafficking offences. Currently out on bail, his future remains uncertain. I had a full-time job once upon a day. Um, I got involved in drugs. Drugs fucking ruined my life. It's ruined the life of my kids. And in the process of that jail time, I lost everything. I lost my positions, I lost my money, I lost all the little things, the little things that I thought that mattered. When I didn't see the big picture, I was losing my family. I lost my family. I finally admitted after, just before Jared went to prison, that I had an addiction, an ice addiction, which is no good. Most of the time I have blamed Jared for it, but at the end of the day, it's, it was me. It was my choice to be an idiot. It wasn't me that introduced it to you. No, I know. It's OK. It's OK. I'm the idiot that took it. I'm the idiot that got the addiction. It's my fault. No, it's the drug's fault. Yeah, but... Everyone who tries it once gets hooked. Mm. I know. It's a putrid drug. Some people would have half a gram and that would last them a week. I would boot half a gram eight or nine times a day. Putrid, I know, but I just keep going. Just keep booting and booting and booting and booting and booting and booting and booting. They've been clean for two weeks and are still fighting withdrawal. But their 19-year relationship is at breaking point for another reason. Dad was away, Mum cheated. Only because I listened to other people saying, oh, Dad, you know, he's going to be away for 25 years. You might as well move on with your life. Then when Dad came out, got out, he found out the truth. Jared wants us together, but it's going to take time. We all need help. We all need counselling. And with the Koha Shed, I think we're on the right directions of getting all the help we need. Even though she's done what she's done and my mates tell me she's fuck dog shit, kick her to the curb, as much as I, as I wanted to, I can't. And I refuse to. Because my kids deserve better than that. They have no government support. They have a lot of healing to do amongst themselves. Yeah. As a family unit, he needs a job, <laughs> like the many others that are out there. Um, they just need that solid support network. It's fucking tough, and we've done it tough, and, like, I'm a big man, and I'm a strong man, you know, and, and, and I carry my pride on my sleeve, and... I have shed more tears in the last 
two weeks than I have in my whole life. I had no work. I was scared about court. I was scared of jail. And I was sitting over in the chair in the corner hiding, sobbing my heart out for hours trying to be quiet so I didn't wake them up. There's no lonelier feeling on this planet knowing you've given it your all and it's just not good enough. Jared and Sharon are in dire straits with no money for a rental bond. Shelby! And the local council has just become aware Lily's turned her unregistered home into a crisis shelter. They don't want to shut us down. They want to work with us in trying to get these registrations. <coughs> this is our passion, is helping those in need. You know, um, yeah, it just makes me emotional. <laughs> Uh, if we don't give them a bed or a couch, where else do they go? You know, who else is going to reach out and help them? Homelessness is one of the most potent examples of disadvantage and social exclusion in Australia today and affects more than 105,000 of us. In Queensland alone, there are 20,000 homeless people, and nearly one in four of those are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Norma and her children are staring that future in the face after receiving an eviction notice two days ago. She and her family are now taking each day at a time. That's where I used to swim in the creek when I was at your age. My mother left me in the gutter when I was eight months old. I was raised by my grandmother. Oh, no, it was good. There was a creek that separated, and on the other side of that creek, that's where the white people live. All the, you know, different children. It wasn't just Aboriginals. It was, you know, other white friends of ours. They're still our friends today. First time I've seen that water flow like that since I grew up. There was no racism, there was no crime. Um, we were just teenagers. Everyone got along. I wish it was still fresh. Yeah, I know. I would have been, you could have been swimming in the creek that I swam in, see? I was taught my culture here in this park. I am a Jaguar person, but I also represent my grandfather's country too. You know, and that's Kadula Yarraman. Well, I had my first son in 1987. I was 15 years old. Joe was old. He was loved by all. It taught me, you know, to love a child, to be there as a mother, something that I didn't have. Oh, 2006, I lost my eldest son. It was a Sunday night. We had a knock on the door about 1.30 in the morning. That's when we were told that my son was in a police chase. There was four boys in a car. Everyone was flung out of the car except my son. Um, he was dead on impact. Six weeks after Joe died at the age of 18, Norma's two youngest sons, Hayden, 11, Glenn, eight, and their nine-year-old cousin, Reginald, were playing on a railway line. They were hit by a train and they were killed instantly, all three of them. I howled. I howled like a dingo for an hour for my children. It was the hardest thing to ever experience in my life as a mother. It still hurts me today. The loss of her three sons and nephew has made Norma appreciate the value of family even more, something not even the threat of eviction can shake. They're running on the evidence of my eldest daughter's minor drug charge, uh, marijuana. That's the reason that they've given me for the eviction. They wanted me to kick my daughter out. Ma, I can't do that. 
If I was to get my daughter out, she'd become another number for this government. Another number on the drugs, another number on the alcohol, incarceration. No. She hopes to make one last appeal to Queensland housing. I'm not a drunk. I don't go out and party or leave my kids all over the place, you know. I don't do any of that. I did all my schooling in Anala. I went to high school in Anala. Had my first job from Anala. It's a part of my life. It'll always be my home. If you lose your home, there's always family to fall back on. But sometimes even they aren't there for you. Hey, Neil. In Melbourne's inner west, Michael's heroin days may be behind him, but his relationship with his family remains broken. That was my friend, Neil. He's late for his mother's funeral, and the prospect of facing relatives who've shunned him for decades terrifies him. I've got to be there in half an hour, and I need something to make me relax a little bit. Um, yeah, a beer and a cigarette. <sighs> nah, I'm wrong. I don't know where this fucking bus goes. Um, the guys at the station will know. I'm wondering, where does the 411 go from? 411? Yeah, to Altona. I don't want to go. Nobody wants to go to their mum's okay. funeral, but okay. most people pile into their family car and then after the funeral, you have a few drinks and you, you, you give whoever a send-off. It's gone completely the wrong way. I've got to go back to where I've just come from, Footscray Plaza, to get the 411. But um, it's not going to be like that for me. My family hate my guts. All right. Right. You know what a smart person to do? Look at a timetable. 12.52. One went at 12.12, one goes at 12.52. So I'll get there about half an hour into the service. And, and that, that suits me. I'm quite happy to sit up the back. Um, this bloody shirt keeps... All right, 12.52, so I've got 10 minutes. That's another, that's another beer. Where is this fucking bus? A lot of what they, the, the nasty text messages I got in the days that after mum died are true as well. I am a smelly junkie, but I'm not a junkie anymore, but I was. <laughs> but they're right about me being dirty, dirty and not, and they're right about my, about mum being ashamed of me. Yeah, she was. OK, so that, that's the truth. That's the truth. I wish my mum... I wish she could have loved me more. It didn't matter how kind I was to animals or people. It, all Mum cared about was that I didn't have a good job and I wasn't Wayne Carey. She used to say that to me all the time. You could have been like Wayne Carey. You could have been anything you wanted, Michael. But you end up taking drugs and, um, and a whole decade of your life is taken away. And the consequences of that mistake live with you forever. <laughs> For Australians living below the poverty line, it's not just about the money. Things like housing and healthcare that many of us take for granted can be a daily struggle. But even when parents give their child the best start, like Michael, 
the cruelty of others can still shape lives. Bullying sounds like it's not a very nasty or something that could fuck your life up. Back then, you know, it was my whole world school. It's my whole world. Yeah, poor mum. I miss her now. She couldn't care less if I was at a funeral, but um, I would be ashamed of myself and feel like a coward if I didn't go. This is my stuff, isn't it? Thank you. Yep. See ya. When I was young, I was best friends with Mum, talked to her all the time, told her when I took drugs for the first time, told her when I went to a nightclub for the first time. So I had um, a relationship where I could tell her things like that. But, um, yeah, she, uh, she was just ashamed of me in adult life. Our politicians tell us they understand and know what's best for us. Love them or loathe them, they call the shots. They only care about power, because they've got the money. Most of them are usually reasonably well off. They just care about power and control. I would love to see one of them do what somebody has to do on a daily fucking basis for a year. I would like them to step foot in somebody else's house on Struggle Street and do what we've got to do for a year. Disheartening to see that Anala never progressed. Oh, we've got Anastasia Palaszczuk's office is just over here. This is the Premier's electorate. Most of her voters all live here. I wrote to her, I thought, oh my gosh, this is Henry Palaszczuk's daughter. Henry was a teacher at our school, at Surfston South State School. He was deadly, talked to him, you know, a number of times over the years with politics and stuff like that. So I thought his daughter might be similar ways. Nah. Karen's joined her friend and fellow Yagra woman Norma, her sister Kelly and their family at the Housing Service Centre in Anala. We're having a First Nations Yagra woman being evicted from her homelands. She's had one of the first families that ever lived in Anala since they set it up. So we're standing in support of Norma, meeting with housing. We're not um, protesting, it's a peaceful gathering. And look at that. They've got all these police here to intimidate us, gathering in support of our sister. What other hope have we got here? We've got no politicians that represent our people. Milton Dick doesn't speak for our people. Neither does Anastasia Palaszczuk. They've moved along the first people. They've moved along the, the low socioeconomic battlers. And they expect us to be happy living like this. But we're saying no more. Daughter Keisha's drug offence means her mother's in breach of her public housing tenancy. A desperate Norma's turned up to protest with the support of her family. I want these people to sit down and talk to me like a human being. Talk to me so I can understand. Listen to me. Don't just throw me out. You can't take my home away from my babies. I've got two little people there. I don't drink. I smoke marijuana. Wow. I survive on $600. Every fortnight, I'm flat out with $70 left. I pay high rent, $583. That leaves me every fortnight $128. And I got six kids, but I make do with what I got. It's bad enough my life was already ruined by losing children. Now they want my home. We got every right to gather in front of that office. We got every right to stand there. We're only having a peaceful gathering. We're not going to smash anything. We're not rioting. You got every right. We still got freedom in this country. My children, my nieces, this is my blood. We are here for each other. This is with the tenants. We're talking about they're, they're, they're accusing her of you guys going to her place. That's what she's getting evicted and looking for kids. The eviction of Norma, a pregnant Keisha, and Norma's two youngest children can happen at any time in the next 14 days without further warning. You know what it is? I will never ever respect you again. Never. 
Never in my life will I ever. I got no respect for you. That's right. I'm angry. We want answers. We want answers because we still have two little people at home that are at school at the moment and when they get home, they want they want to know if we're still going to be living at home. We've gone upstairs and spoken to the lady. Um, so she says she's quite happy to talk to you today. What, now, after she's... Brother, come on. Well, we got here before and I was, went up and spoke to her to find out what the story was. Well, she I am not going up there myself. I'm taking my cousin with me. We'll go and ask if she can go. I'm not going myself, no. I'm not going to ask her to go. I'm not going to ask her but no respect. Would it be a shame? Oh, I do. So hopefully we get a good outcome out of this. We just have to wait and see until they come out of this meeting and then we go from there. Norma and Karen have had 10 minutes with housing officials. They've um, met with us to tell us that it's gone out of their hands and QCAT, the body that oversees the housing and tenancy uh, business, it's down in QCAT that this could be dealt with. Yeah. My body's just shaking, eh? They had no issues with Norma directly as the tenant. They, they, it was only because of police going to her. That's what they're basing their, um, their eviction on. And now she's, she's, she suffers with a stress disorder and now she's, she's just gone into a, um, a shock. It's, it's too much for her, yeah. I haven't shaken like this since the day I buried my children. That's... Eviction is just one factor that can lead to homelessness. But the one that's most preventable is when people leave institutions, such as prison, with nothing to fall back on. In southwest Brisbane, home for former prisoner Jared, his partner Sharon and the four children, has been a garage on the Koha Shed's property for the past few days. Oh, um, are you right? It's not an easy place to do homework for 16-year-old Trinity when there's two adults, two brothers and a sister on top of you. Grade 11's hard. Really hard. Harder than I thought it would be. We have exam block in the next few weeks, assignments all June. It's really stressful. Get ready. Dad. Yeah. What were your daily routines like when well, you were in jail? I'd wake I up. I wasn't even finished my question and you started talking. OK, my bad. I'm doing my assignment for school. It's a documentary. We had to choose a marginalised subject for our assignment and I decided to choose prison life and realised that my dad was out of jail, so I thought it was a good idea. What are your daily routines in jail? Wake up, have a shower, Shave my legs, brush my teeth, see how the door opens, and then um, nothing. Train, go out in the yard and train, train, eat, sleep, work out, repeat. When Dad went jail, I got teased, but it wasn't like teased to the point I was getting bullied. It was just they thought it was funny that my dad was in jail and theirs wasn't. Mum, tell Peyton to Shelby, bum bum, shush please. So when I went to jail, I was still fried for weeks. They, they, they call it drunk, you know, you come off the street drunk. I was still high for about three months. All I would think about was Sharon and the kids and make, and it was going through my head and through my head and through my head and knowing Sharon was probably still on the crack and not fucking around and the kids were at home by themselves and not being able to just pick up the phone and ring them. What was the thing you look forward to the most? Getting out. Other than that? Visits. What was so great about visits? I got to see my missus and kids come in for, for an hour. There's nothing more important in jail than having your family come in. So I think for an hour you get a cuddle, you don't get to talk about much, but I got to sit there with my kids. How did that make you feel? Grateful. 
I think I got my first photos once I've been there 12 months. And that's, that's fucking tough. That's when you know something's not right. And then my kids told her she was seeing someone else. And then she tried to deny it, which made it worse. And then it just fucked the visit. When Dad went to jail, that was probably the roughest patch I've ever been through. I was angry to start off with, and I was embarrassed to, like, for a while, but then I just got over it, and I was like, oh, can't change what's happened now, so I just let it be. Goodbye. Mum, get on the chair. Hello. <laughs> Look at her shit herself. She's like, I don't want to do that. Don't ask you what she got up to when I was in jail. That we one question I don't ask. Get your ass over here and sit down, Mama. I've stuffed up over the years. I'm not afraid to admit it now. You know, I'm ashamed of what I've done, but at the end of the day, I need to guide the kids the right way. You know, don't follow mum okay. or dad's um, footsteps. What was the biggest struggle personally for you when Jared was in jail? Housing. Housing. Trying to find a place for myself and four children to stay. Trudy was very angry at me, but half the time her anger was aimed at me because of Dad. But she took it out on her mother because it's Mum's fault Dad didn't come. Dad broke another promise. The feeling of losing your parents to drugs is, is fucking heartbreaking. And I guess at a point in time, I did hate them. I hate them for everything that they did to me. I did hate them for everything they did to Shelby, Peyton, Ashley. I just, I just hate them. The family is at a crossroads. The younger children were born here and they're all keen to make Australia their permanent home. And with Jared currently on bail, he can't simply pack up and move everyone to New Zealand, even if he wanted to. But that situation could change if a court decides his outstanding drug offences are serious. A head sentence of 12 months or more and it's, and it's instant deportation. And I've already done 16 months, so in, in my view, it, it, it could well be a chance, but until we know what's going on, it's not, I have, it's just hanging there, yeah. What's your name? Shelby. How old are you? Nine. What family member of yours went to jail? Dad. How did that make you feel when your dad was in jail? Angry, lonely, and it's sad. Why did it make you feel like that? Because it's hard for me to ha not have a dad around while he's while he's um, gone. They are brilliant kids. They've just had a shit go. My son is struggling with it, something fierce. He hates his mum with a passion, you know, and my daughter is waiting for me to explode and Sharon's waiting for me to just rip apart, you know? She's waiting for me to fucking explode and do some damage because of it, but it's not gonna come because uh, it is what it is. I was in jail for fuck's sake, shit happens. Do you have any goals you want to achieve now that your dad's out of jail? Um, yes, I only have one. What is that? That there will be no arguing between my, my parents. Family can cause the deepest of wounds, but it can also bind us and make us stronger. Whatever path we choose in life, it's never too late to make amends. Oh. The funeral was lovely. My brother did a really good job. My brother is a fucking asshole, but um, what he wrote was... Um, it was just beautiful. When I got up and spoke, I just mumbled something. I can't even remember what I said for 30 seconds, but um, I, I do know I told everyone I was scared about the future without... Um, I don't know why I'm scared. She never helped other times. Um, it's just that um, there's no more mum and dad. No more mum and dad at all. <laughs> we all gotta go through it, yeah? Yeah, and one day you'll die too. Everything's temporary in this silly world, you know? God makes like us. We're over here for a while, and that's why we've got to look after each other. <laughs> Thanks, mate. I needed that. I needed that. I did. Next time on Struggle Street. Welcome to Broad Meadows. They call this the suburb of, of all dodgy people. Mm -hmm.
Mm. If I was 15, 20 us addicts in here, and all it's done is wreck our community over the last 10 years. It just keeps ripping it apart bit by bit. The car industry's gone now. Ford's gone, Toyota's going, Holden's going. It's stressful having to go home and deal with all their stuff and where we are and everything. Oh, look, come on, you're just scaring my son. Fuck, man. Come on. Come on. Today's the 13th. You have to leave. This is what it takes to remove me from my house.